Here is Carl Stevens in his own words on what happens to those who question God's man, meaning Stevens. Don't you say a sentence, not a sentence, not a line. Don't presume or you'll die. He intimidates you from the pulpit. He says that if you leave, the Bible speaks, and you speak uh, anything about the Bible speaks, meaning speaking anything negative about the Bible speaks, you'll get cancer of the throat, cancer of the larynx, you will die. And in another sermon on those who speak against the Bible speaks. So we're meeting here today with Paul Fitzpatrick, who has had quite an interesting association with the Greater Grace Church, Greater Grace Church, also called the Greater Grace World Outreach, which has many branches around the world, headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland. And I met, I met Paul through Mario. Mario had also had an experience with a pastor here, Larry Speedy, who was pretty corrupt. So Paul, I want to, we're going to go into this discussion. I want you to tell me first, what's your history with this church? Well, well, I, um, I heard of uh, Great Grace World Outreach is their official name. I, I heard of them. Um, I'd only been a believer, a Christian, for about two years. Back in uh, not, back in '96, I got saved. In '97, I was going to a. I was working at a company, and my manager, um, who I knew was a born again believer, uh, kept saying to me that you need you I need to know about the finished work. Um, of Jesus Christ so he was going to a church in London and he invited me to go along to a Wednesday night Bible study I went along and uh, I was very uh, I was very um, interested in, in what I heard there was a guy come over from the States from the home base church in Baltimore in Maryland the guy was called Pastor Lutz L-U-T-Z he's not there anymore he's one of the many uh, pastors that left after Sandy Cove and um, yeah, and um, I say probably slowly over a period of time, because I was really going to a church in London, the church that I got converted in, in a place called Bromley in South East London. And um, over a period of time, um, I went to some meetings with my manager and I decided to uh, to start attending the church. Um, so I, was, I guess I first got involved with Growing Grace World Outreach in well their church was in west wickham in the county of kent not far from bromley they were renting a building at the time they had a guy there called uh, pastor bob who was not officially a greater grace world outreach pastor but he was affiliated all the churches worldwide globally i guess we would say um are they're called affiliates of the main branch which is in baltimore in maryland and um yeah you know and I, I guess I, I i went along for about a year and um, went on for about a year, and uh, the, the guy there who was a Texan, there's some American people there from home base, the guy there was a Texan, worked for uh, uh, Shell Oil, a uh, lovely, lovely guy. Uh, he said to me that in order to get to know the heart of the ministry, I would need to take a trip to Baltimore, which is what I did. I went over there for their June convention that they hold every year, um, I went over there in, I believe it was 98, I went over there, um, Pastor Carl Stevens, Pastor Carl Stevens was, he's died now, he was the uh, head pastor there, um, there was probably about 5,000 people there, pastors from all over the world come back for the annual June convention, they talk about all their outreach work, and um, yeah, you know, I was very impressed initially with um what I, uh, what I witnessed, but what I did witness, and I was, I was quite a few of us went from the London church, what I did witness that did really cause me some grounds for concern, and I raised it with my manager who was, you know, who I'd gone to the London church with. Um, Carl Stevens, wherever he went, on the grounds of the church, they bought a huge supermarket uh, on a site you could probably park about, well, again, probably about four or 5,000 vehicles, uh, and they bought this huge supermarket and converted it into their church. And everywhere that he went, um, there were people following him. I mean, I'm not talking about four or five. I'm talking about maybe two or three hundred people would follow him wherever he went, like he was, I'm sorry to say, Pied Piper. I, I, I was quite, I thought this was quite concerning because all through the convention, which lasts, I think it's about five days, but obviously if you're going to fly to the States from London, you're going to go there for two weeks, is what I always did. 
as you go from Sunday to Sunday, and uh, you would get other other pastors within the ministry would be doing a, a talk, a presentation, whatever. Uh, Carl Stevens would rock up into the room, and people would just get out and leave. And when he left, and I thought, well, this this isn't right. You know, this is concerning. This is not right behaviour. And, and in time, obviously, you know, I was there six years um, in London, but I went over to Baltimore four times in that, uh, five times in total. And um, I got to see a lot of the cracks in the, in the plaster work in the ceiling, as we say over here in London. But, um, yeah, it was obvious that he was, um, he, he was hero worships and um, whatever he said went. And so during this time, then you also met some other pastors, right? Yeah. Well, just, just, um, and we're going to start talking about what your specific experiences was, were when you uh, yeah. engage with these pastors. So first mm. we'd like to hear, you know, what was your experience with the Greater Grace founder, Carl Stevens? What types of things did you experience when you knew him? Well, when I was there, they, they had, um, that's, that's not Carl Stevens. When, when I was there, it isn't. Uh, they have, and they still do it. They have a grace hour at your time. It's early in the morning, um, every morning. I think it's on a Monday morning, they have a grace hour radio talk show that is held, um, well, on the stage. It should be an auto, but it's a stage in the main building. And uh, Carl Stevens would officiate. He would head that up. And um, he would have his son, Paul Stevens, who was in the ministry as associate pastor at the time, and normally a guest pastor. I mean, at Baltimore, they had on the premises, they had a home base um, all the time. They had a number of pastors, probably about, probably about 80 to 100 pastors would be located at the home base church in Baltimore all the time. And they would be involved in various ministries and that, and they'd get sent out when a new church was, um, you know, came into existence in another, in another country. Um, and they would have guest pastors come to Grace Hour, and you'd get people phoning in, you know, asking questions about people, not necessarily from the ministry, people, a lot of people from other ministries, asking questions about Grady Grace and what they taught. You know, and Carl Stevens would say, well, if you don't like what I'm saying, get your own radio show and you come off. And, and of course, everyone would laugh. And I would sit there thinking, well, would Christ do that? I mean, you know, it's not, it's not, not really, it's not really what, what you should be doing. But there, there, there you go. You know, everybody thought that Carl Stevens, it was, uh, it was an unwritten understanding that he had a, a direct line to God. We obviously know that we all got a direct line to God through the word of God. But so he, he, would, he would lead all the evening meetings. Obviously, he was a head pastor. He led all the evening meetings, all the Sunday meetings, Wednesday night Bible study. And he would say from the pulpit that he, because he spent so long in private study every day, five hours a day, he'd say this regularly, um, that he used to hear from God. He would get private revelation or, or to be specific, private understanding of what God would say in his word and then he would teach this as um, what, what God was saying to him as leader of GGWO. Um, he invited me to his house when I was over there in 99 uh, and I never got to go because I went up with what is now the ministry's head pastor, Pastor Tom Schaller, who I had a lot of, uh, lot of respect for. I went up to New England on a, on a ministry trip um, with about two or three other guys. Adam Speedy was one of the guys. He was at Brady Grace at the time at their Bible college. And uh, about 99, 2000 this was. And um, yeah, we had a great time and I never got to go to his house. But um, yeah, um, you know, I mean, what experience I had with Carl Stevens, any Grady Grace member who was there, who had eyes to see discernment, perception, uh, and many people at the time were questioning what was going on. We didn't know half of what was going on at the time anyway. Um, but nobody really had the guts to say anything because he was hero worshipped. What were the years you were at the Great Yeah, from, ni from 98 to 2004. I actually left the church. I had left the London church in 2005. Um, you've got the slide there about Carl Stevens changing his name of Church of Greater Grace, Lord yeah. Outreach, from what it was originally called the Bible Speaks. 
Yeah. I actually joined GGWO when it was Grady Grace World Outreach. But he would talk, he would talk Carl Stevens frequently in the Grace Hour radio broadcast and, and from the pulpit. He would talk uh, many, many times about the, um, the, how the church came into being, about he, how he was out on the road one day. Uh, you know, quite a strange story. He stopped by a, a lake or somewhere and, and God gave him a vision to start a church. Uh, and that's what he did, you know, he called it the Bible Speaks. But um, th this stuff that um, came out regarding the, uh, the, the, the inheritance or the, the, the loan or the gift that was given uh, by this lady to, uh, well, to the Bible Speaks, uh, that was never spoken about until it actually became, uh, until it came into the public domain. It, it was never spoken about, he never spoke about it. Carl Stevens used to say to them all the time, if only I can just find one millionaire. And apparently, he did. How much did you give? Oh, about seven million. Yeah, or in 2005, were you around when the disaffiliation happened? No, interestingly, I'd already left the London church, but I still, my manager that I'd worked with at the time, um, by then I was in another job, but I was very friendly with him, a lovely guy. Um, he, he, well, he and I obviously still good friends, brothers in Christ, and I knew a lot of people from the ministry that I was still in touch with. And uh, then this disaffiliation happened very, very shortly after I left the London church, very shortly after. Um, what was your experience with his son, with Carl Stevens' son, Paul? Well, yeah, you know, Paul Stevens was, um, he was constantly a guest of the Grace Hour, he, he taught regularly, um, he had his own ministry. Um, he wrote a book, when he, he ministered about, you know, this is um, quite strange really, uh, ironic. He, he had a ministry about relationships. And he wrote a book uh, which was hugely popular amongst people in the ministry. He wrote a book, um, I can't remember the exact title. It was, called, it was something about love, how to love people in relationships or something. It's a very famous book within the ministry, went worldwide. And um, yeah, you know, we, we all thought that he had, um, you know, that it, it made the grade. We all respected him. He was um, Carl Stevens' son. Um, he was one of um, three brothers. There was uh, Steve, Steve Stevens, who, if I remember correctly, wasn't a well man. And there was another brother, but it was mainly Paul Stevens who was, um, who, who co-led the church. I don't know if I'm right in saying that because Carl Stevens was definitely the, the number one man. But so yeah, everybody knew Paul Stevens. He, he, was, uh, he was a well um, presented figure. Um, everyone in Baltimore knew him, you know, he, he would travel the world, all that, go on different conferences. Um, really, I only knew him um, through, through the position that he held at Grady Grace in the in the Baltimore church. Did you hear anything about the affair that he had with this woman? No, uh, no that, that didn't come out until, and it was, it, was a dis, it was the disaffiliation. This is what caused the split. The affair didn't come out until um, very, very shortly before the disaffiliation. Yes. So the gentleman who was involved, his wife uh, was preyed upon by Paul Stevens, and he has quite an extensive... Uh, cataloging of everything that happened in their marriage yeah, and the, the manipulation that happened. And one point he makes was that um, Paul Stevens was considered a marriage counselor, uh, yeah. but, he, but he took advantage of a lot of factors and, and his wife's emotional vulnerability is one because that's something that's common among the people in power at Greater Grace. And that kind of leads us, um, that'll lead us to another person later who, who preyed upon somebody who was vulnerable. At, uh, uh, the I next one. What was your experience with Great and Grace manager, Pastor uh, Larry um, Who I knew was a born again believer. Well, uh, this is something to me that you need to know can. about the finished Larry work and his wife, um, of Bev Jesus Steve, Christ. So he was going um, to a church in London, London from and he invited me to go along to a Wednesday night Bible study. I went along. 
Um, and we uh, never I was really very, uh, got to um, um, interest in find out how the guy came up. He was associated with the Home Base Church in Baltimore, Maryland. It's very possible that our pastor in London is not there anymore. He's one of the many pastors that left Africa because after Sandy Cove, prior to coming to London, before that, he was really going to the church on furlough at London and converted in in a place called Bromley. Tony Morley was a pastor for a period of time. I went to see meetings for the land manager, or I decided to work to start attending the church. It won't be. Um, Larry Speedy so came to I guess London I first as a church member to help out uh, Tony in, Morley. Well, their because, uh, church was in Tony West Wickham in the county of Kent, uh, not serious far from problems Bromley, that I rent the London building, church. At the time, they were aware of because called, uh, we, Bob, we made them aware of was not it. And Larry Speedy... You know, Brady Grace uh, brought out a beneficial pastor, thing, really, isn't it? In the eyes of all, all the churches worldwide, um, Brady, Kay Modi was presented as coming over to um, help um, out. They're called pastor affiliates Tony of Morley. the main branch. Um, I'd say probably Maryland. for at least and, the first um, year. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was in guess London. I, I, I went along um, for about a year. Yeah, you know, he and, presented um, himself as went on for an about amiable a year, guy, a likeable uh, guy. The, the, the guy, guy there who was a Texan, to, and to, to, you know, from home where she passed. The guy there was a Texan who worked for, for uh, a uh, big shell oil. And, a lovely, um, lovely yeah, guy. Yeah, you know, he was... Um, uh, he said to me that in order to get to know the heart of the ministry, I would need to take a trip to Baltimore, which is what I did. I went over there for their summons in June. The the old convention and they, they made him here. into a pastor. Uh, they gave him an official title. In, I believe it was the Larry Speedy. He came back from Baltimore. Went over there. Um, and um, suddenly he, he wouldn't, if Carl you addressed Stevens him as Larry, was, he's died he now. wouldn't answer he anymore. Was the, no, he was the head church there. there. I used to have a lot um, of there was probably about social meetings. That there. is the way of Grady Grace Outreach. They call that body life the body-like meetings annual June where, where people get together all their outreach work. If you addressed um, him as Larry, um, yeah, you know, know, I was very impressed just ignore you. initially with um, and, uh, you might what say I, uh, what I witnessed, but what I did see right next, next to you, so a few of us went from the London church, and then you say, well, well, I did Larry, witness that it did really cause me some grounds for concern, and I, thought, well, that's, and I raised that's it with my manager, you know, we let it go to the London church, and, um, as Paul he became wherever um, he went or in the church, church they bought within the London a huge church supermarket he um, uh, on a site well, you, you know thinking rightly out. he he became well, again probably about I would say four, five thousand power and position uh, and they really, bought this huge supermarket and put it into his church. Head. Now, and everywhere that he went, himself, um, there were people uh, following him. I mean, I'm not talking about four or five. Um, was it I'm talking about maybe two or three hundred people would follow him? Was it engineered by him? Uh, was he actually like this? And for the first year that he was here in London, was he just playing a game? This is all presumption on my part. It's all speculation, but it does lead you to wonder. Anyway, um, yeah, I mean, I, I left I left the church in London, as I say, about 2004, early 2005. And uh, I went to, uh, it was his wife Bev's birthday, and I went to his house in uh, I think it was in Catford somewhere, local area to Bromley, and uh, I gave him. He came to the door. I gave him a, a card for his wife, birthday card, and uh, everything was amicable. And I said to him on the way out that I'd see him at the next Eurocon, which they held. They just started. They started a church in Budapest in Hungary. It's a very big church, and uh, they were holding their equivalent of the Baltimore Eurocon every year, uh, and it was in the uh, in the in the spring. And I said, I'll, I'll see you at the next one, which was coming up in a few months. And, and that was it. I left and uh, I drove home. He, he turned up on the doorstep of the, I was, I was sharing a flat with two other guys who were still going to the London church. And he came, he came to the door. I, I, he asked for me. I went to the door, surprised to see him. And he was just going nuts just from the word go, from the get go. He was going nuts saying, you can't come to your own coin if you're not going to sit under Pastor Morley, if you don't recognise Pastor Morley as your pastor, you can't have anything to do with the church, you're not welcome anywhere. And, and he was, you know, for a guy who I guess at the time must have been 50, again, presumption on my part, he must have been 50, he was just behaving like a five-year-old. And uh, I, I was, at first I was quite shocked. And uh, then I took a step back and, uh, you know, I said to him, this is a long time ago, it's 15 years ago, I said to him, well, you know, Larry, he recognised him as a pastor, 
um, Larry, uh, what's the matter with you? You behave like a five-year-old, and, and it, it, he just went into overdrive. And in the end, I said, look, Larry, you know, you need to calm down. You need to start acting like an adult, and uh, and you need to leave. And he did. And what was the part when you said you had to give him three warnings? He was he threatened to hit you, or what was well, it? Well, no, he didn't threaten to hit me, but I was going red in the face. You know, I I seriously considered that he was he was going to thump me. I mean, he he was going absolutely nuts. He was going mental. Yes. So what you're describing here is the same thing that Mario talked about. So yeah. Mario had told me how he had run into Larry on the beach one day, and Larry yeah. went. Uh, um, he had to warn him off right in front of his, uh, right, he was trying to recruit for his cult, and Mario warned the people off, and yeah. Larry actually got physical with Mario, and he had to defend mm. himself, um, so he was screaming and rage, enraged at him, and his face was demonic, so that's just yeah. pretty much the same thing that you were describing, and this is 15 years later, he's still doing the same thing. Well, I, I would say now, and you got there on your heading, Pastor Speedy, this is Pastor Larry Speedy, because his son... Pastor Adam Speedy is now a great, great world outreach pastor. I would say that Mario's experience with Pastor Larry Speedy, uh, I would say that it's been 15 years down the line. Uh, Larry Speedy, obviously power and position now that he's got his own church within the ministry. I would say that power and position has obviously gone to his head and, and he's obviously become completely power crazy. And I, I would say that the experience that Mario related to myself in Mario and Mai's email communiques, um, it, it tends to show me, it tends to reveal to me that Larry has, Larry's behavior has um, substantially got worse. Yeah. Substantially, I mean exponentially. You know, another thing about Mario is I think that, uh, that Larry had gotten a restraining order against Mario. He couldn't say anything. So mm. when, when it expired, Mario spoke out. And um, he, he, he talked about how Larry Speedy did these lewd acts right in front of him at church where he grabbed his, Larry Speedy grabbed his wife's, you know, whatever, and right in front of her. And Crazy. He was encouraging the way his girlfriend to split up with him and, and instead hang out with a 65-year-old man. And, and he was... Uh, it just had a really, uh, it's, it's, you know, a kind of predatory approach. And one thing that Mario also mentioned is that somebody in the UK, so this was in Limassol, in, in, in Greece. Limassol, yeah. yeah. Limassol. And yeah. Um, so the, the one thing that Mario mentioned was that uh, people had said that Larry Speedy behaved weird, quote, weird around children. So what does weird mean? Does that mean he had, he's behaving like a pedophile? You know, so I just wonder if there isn't more going on behind just besides being weird if there's something else more going on behind all that yeah well I, I find this quite interesting because he he larry speedy did not exhibit this um we're alleging pedophilic behavior when he was in the london church but and i think it must be a but when he was in the london church he was a new to the ministry b initially wasn't a pastor, wasn't a recognized Grady Grace appointed pastor. And, and, you know, was he just, we would say, keeping his head down? Was he keeping a low profile? In the 15 years that have passed since 2005 and where we are now in um, two, 2020, I would say that Larry Speedy's behavior has got seriously, well, seriously deteriorated. Mm. Uh, and to be honest with you, I'll be very honest with you, I'm shocked to hear, um, and I don't doubt the truth of it, but I'm shocked to hear that, that a, a man who calls himself a man of God, and I'm referring to Larry Speedy, can behave in such a manner. Um, and I'm also, I'll go on from that to say, I'm also shocked to hear that Great Race World Outreach in Baltimore will, would let him stay on as a pastor. But I do know from personal experience, because we've had it with Tony Morley, they do not... Uh, they, they do not make their pastors accountable. And even if you can prove cons with, without a shadow of a doubt that the pastors are acting in an ungodly manner, they will not remove them from the churches. Right. Yeah. In fact, and I I've had got personal experience with this. Right. So you've got the experience with it. And then Mario's got the experience. Yeah. And I also contacted, um, I also contacted yeah, Greater Grace. 
regarding the allegations yeah. against their own pastor. So I contacted yeah. them. I took a screenshot of it. Um, so are they aware of what's going on? Yeah. And there's a website posted about him, which somebody happened to post. And then uh, this guy responded back, Steve Andrew Lanis, who is a pastor. And you made the remark how this church recruits anybody to be a pastor. They'll take anybody, right? Because it's yeah, just, yeah. Is this just an empire yeah. breed? Is that all it is? Yeah, when, when, when I, the last time that I was over in Baltimore, sorry interrupting you, the last time yeah. I was over in Baltimore, which was probably around... 2000, probably around 2002 or three. Last time I was over there, um, Pastor Shaller, Pastor Tom Shaller, as I say, I think, yeah, I believe he's a man of God. He's now the uh, the head pastor out there. Um, pastor Shaller um, would say um, that, um, yeah, you know, they they would um, they would look to counsel pastors that were experiencing problems within their ministry um but um it, it was it was considered that um a pastor could be reformed but the problem was that um and as we're seeing here many weren't yeah they, they, have they have the solution they have the solution to reform them and so this is what this is what Steve Steve Anderlanis responded responded back exactly like you're saying. Yeah. You shall handle the situation in accordance with the principles outlined by Christ in Matthew 18, which means yeah. that they think they can reform them. So, but they're never removing them from a position of power. They're never That's protecting right. the public. They're still letting them be right. afraid yeah. upon. Yeah, I can I can vouch for that personally myself. Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen it. I've seen it. Mario's seen it. Yeah. Uh, so these people don't don't hold anybody accountable. Uh, even no. themselves. Well, I mean, look at Paul Stevens again, interrupting you. He had an affair with a married woman. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the woman's husband was allegedly paid off to keep quiet, mm -hmm. and uh, Paul Stevens was allowed to continue in pastoring. It's mental. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh... Yep. They, so that tell you know just indicates to you that is this really a church or is this really just a form of corruption? You know, is there really any is anything divine going on or is it really, um, you know, a, a form of predatory? Well, I, I I would say I I think they're pyramid building. You know, we we have we've got it over here. You get the Avon lady come to your door, and that whole empire, the whole business is based on exponentially increasing your agents and when you if you were to apply that uh, hypothetically to the ggwo uh, mandate not that they have a mandate um if you were to apply that business model you would say it was an exact fit yes yeah is it just a business you know is there really anything going on yeah um, now, on to the issue of, uh, of Larry, Larry Speedy's kids. So one of his kids was Adam Speedy. Yeah. And then he had I know a, Adam had, Speedy personally, yeah. Yes. And then he also had a daughter. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and you had mentioned that she, she apparently had a child out of wedlock, which is a... Well, it wasn't parent because she came to London with the child, yeah. To, yes. And, then and you, she wasn't she was married, married, so it wasn't a parent. No, it was in your face. Yeah. And what did uh, Tony, you had said something to, I believe, Judy Morley about it? And what uh, I said, well, well, it was said, um, Tony Morley's wife, Joyce, who, he, he was an English guy, born in Southampton in England, Portsmouth, down on the southwest coast. Um, he, he met his wife earlier on in the ministry, we're talking about Tony Morley here, who, who's still currently the pastor of uh, the Grady Grace Christian Church in Lower Sydenham in southeast London. Um, his wife uh, is an American lady. Oh, her name is Joyce, J-O-Y-C-E, Joyce Morley. And um, she made a comment. She was very, uh, she was very happy to come over to um, groups of guys, brothers in Christ or whatever, in a, you know, a personal private conversation. You just come over and, and start, you know, joining in, which in London isn't a done thing, even in society. And uh, anyway, she, she suddenly, she exclaimed to me one day, that uh, Larry Speedy's daughter, Larry and Beth Speedy's daughter, was a trophy of grace. Now, this phrase, trophy of grace, came directly from Baltimore. It was said, it was bandied about many, many times. 
And, and what she meant by it was, because we all know what's meant by it in the ministry, was that somebody had been um, found out being involved in deep, unrepentant sin, and they'd then become repentant without expressing any kind of remorse, and they were allowed back into the ministry. Now, um, admittedly, the family weren't initially part of the ministry, but they were welcomed with open arms to London. And uh, the daughter um, of Larry and Bev Speedy and Adam Speedy's uh, sister, um, yeah, she she was, uh, she's only a young girl in her early 20s, she was, uh, I wouldn't say paraded, but she, she was um, advertised or presented mm. within the London church as a trophy of grace. Mm. Um, I could go on to say a lot more. What do you think? So, yeah, the massive contradiction being then that she wasn't following, you know, the rules that were set out. So she wasn't who they presented her to be. Um, yeah, which is, you know, that, that's the part of the whole issue of the contradiction. Is this, a, is this a genuine organization or is it really just a business? That, that has no qualm about, uh, you know, contradicting it. Yeah, I, I, I personally believe, uh, I could be wrong, you know, because the uh, the, the massive court case with the, the huge millions of dollars that were given to the church, and, and then they changed the name, I'm talking about Carl Stevens. I, I initially, I still believe that Carl Stevens set out to form a church that was based on God's word. It's my no. personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that somewhere down the line, power went to his head and it turned into a cult. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it's feasible to say, and, and again, this is speculation on my part, I think it's feasible to say from what I've been a Christian 25 years, from what I know of biblical doctrine, that if you're truly born again, the Holy Spirit within your heart, within your core of your being, your spiritual uh, mindset, he, he witnesses to you when you're doing things that are wrong. So when I look at what's happened when I was there and since I've left within Great Grace World Outreach, I question whether tr people were truly born again. Yes. I mean, that's what all this is doing, is leading people to question the organization. We're all just That's why we want to bring the, the truth out so people can make an informed decision. Yeah, that's yeah, totally. I agree with, with that. Yeah, totally yeah. on board with that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now there was apparently uh, hmm. a pastor's son-in-law of one of the, so Greater Grace has many pastors and there was a certain pastor's son-in-law who has a pretty, uh, a little bit of a salacious background here. Do you want to hmm. tell us what you know about that? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the pastor's son-in-law who, again, I know personally, he is, uh, I would say he's probably a good 20 years younger than me. He, turned up at a Greater Grace London church meeting one Sunday morning uh, many, many years ago, as well still and probably going back about 18 years ago. Um, and, and he was very, he just appeared out of nowhere. He's very bubbly. Um, he, uh, he was a single guy. He'd come from a rock concert with his father the previous night, a uh, guitarist who I know very well. American guy, American guitarist, and a fighter boy. But um, it, uh, anyway, he he got friendly with a very good friend of mine, who's still a very good friend of mine, a Christian brother, uh, who I've known for twenty four years. And um, he and m myself, my Christian brother, and and this guy, what we calling him Maxwell Doe. Yeah, we're calling him Maxwell Doe. Um, we we got quite friendly and. Um, he introduced me, Maxwell Doe introduced me to his father who lived in, uh, who lived in Bromley on the suburbs of Bromley and his father's my age and his father was, as far as I'm aware, a, he was a true born again believer but he wasn't going to any of the Great Grace churches um, but Maxwell Doe, I don't know, well apparently he, he got to know about the ministry online somewhere, I don't know the details and Maxwell Doe had just come, it was coming in the summer in, in London, and he'd just come from America, where he had been, you would say, on vacation with uh, a number of younger people, people from his own generation, own age. And, and he'd had what he described as a wicked time out there. He'd met loads of girls. He was a single guy, you know, American ladies on there, a lot more 
open and um, congenial than, than people are over in London because, you know, we've got this thing over here that, that people are more like an island because we're born on an island. And uh, anyway, but, um, yeah, and, and it, it was a very bubbly character, this guy, Maxwell Doe. Within a short space of time, he started a relationship with, um, or we call him Ghislaine Maxwell, with this girl. Um, no, this oh, is, no, this is the, no, teenage, no, no. the teenage girl. Yeah, the teenage girl. We're calling her the teenage girl because that was someone else. Uh, he started a relationship with a teen with this with this other lady, and uh, because myself, my friend, and and this guy Maxwell Doe, we were seeing each other quite regularly during the week uh, and all day Sunday, whatever. Um, being the older man, I, I it, well, he admitted in in a, when we were out on a social event, he admitted to myself and my friend that he was having sex with this young lady and uh, you know I said to him you've got to knock that on the head which over here means you've got to bring that to a close you've got to stop doing it and and he said to me oh, I can't and I said well look, you're, you're going to go and have to speak to our pastor pastor Tony Morley about this which he did which is good and uh, he came back to us and this is the second party information but he came back to us and said that he was counseled from the pastor that he either had to give up the relationship or marry the girl. So he married the girl. So he married a teenage girl? Not a teenage girl, no. Um, he, married, he married, the girl that he married the, the is pastor's not the teenage daughter. girl that we've spoken about before. Um, th this was a girl who already came to London with a child um, who was in her early 20s. Oh, so he married the, he married the, the, he was the pastor's son-in-law, so he married the pastor's daughter. He married the pastor's daughter. Instead of <laughs> so who, that was at the, the time wasn't a pastor. Oh, he wasn't. So at the so that was the that was Tony Morley's solution was for him to get married in order to yeah. stop having an affair. Well, that that's what he reported to us was Tony yeah. Morley's solution. And to be fair, uh, that is what happened. I mean, we would call it in society over here in, in the UK, we would call it a shotgun wedding. Yeah. But um, yeah, he, he, um, he, he got married very swiftly to said lady, yeah. So um, do you remember how old he was? Was he in his late 20s or? Yeah, no, I would say, I would say he couldn't have been older than 21, 22. Okay. And uh, the teenage girl was 17. So in the U.S., depending on the age difference, that could be considered statutory rape. No, no, it's a different girl. Laws. It's a different girl. It's not the teenage girl. So he had he, two... He subsequently had an affair with the teenage girl. So the, 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 the lady, the young lady that he married... Yeah. ...was at the time the daughter of the, the of the guy that came to London to help out Tony Morley. Yeah. He subsequently went on, i.e. within a year of marrying this young lady, he yeah. had an affair with said teenage girl. Okay, yes, yeah. Yeah, so, and she was only it's 17. Not, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's easy to get confused because a uh, huge amount of sin happening. Yeah, he said, how many affairs can he have, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, and he so, and this, yeah. Yeah, the teenage girl's mother had died, so she was in a position. She was younger than him and vulnerable, and yeah. he he was kind of connected to some status in the church. So yeah. well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah really, uh, they can abuse power. Um, okay, what was your experience with Tony Morley, one of the Greater Grace pastors? Well, what can I say? I mean, there's very little that I can say about Tony Morley who on your slide is the guy on, as it's presented to me, the far left with a microphone. Um, Tony Morley um, came to London after, we, we didn't know him, if you pardon the expression from Adam, we had no experience of him in London. We didn't know who he was. He had previously pastored another Great Grace Church in a place called Ellesmere Port, which is uh, just on the border of the country of Wales and the Midlands in the UK. Um, he'd pastored that church uh, a, a relatively younger man uh, with his wife. And uh, there were lots of problems up there. 
um, which again were only spoken of in private within church members and I mean I knew people up there we used to go up there or to see people and whatever uh, because we knew them but we, we met in Baltimore and you met when you went to Budapest and that different places um, uh, and, and I'm sorry to say this but a lot of people in the church in Ellesmere Port um, didn't have many positive things to say about him so anyway we we were at the time without a pastor in London We'd been without a pastor in London for about 18 months, two years, because uh, the previous guy had retired, gone back to the States. And uh, it, it was given us, we, we were told by, uh, well, presumably by Carl Stevens, uh, an edict was issued from Baltimore because we were, we, were, we were desperately in need of a pastor. We wanted a pastor. And we were told that we would have to invite this guy, Tony Morley, over to London um, to, to be our pastor and that would be seen within the ministry as, as legal and binding and that we had invited him. The problem was nobody knew him, nobody really knew who he was, what he was about, um, I'm sorry to say it but what quality of a man of God that he was, you know we knew nothing about him. So anyway he came over on his own, he came over from Baltimore for a visit and uh, I, I at the time was working on, I was working for London buses and uh, I was a bus driver, I've been a bus driver for a number of years. And I can remember the very, he stayed at the house of a very well respected couple um, that, that were going to our church, where the, the wife was and, and the son uh, had been at the uh, Bible College in Baltimore for a number of years. And um, the very first meeting I had of him, I was driving my bus, which is double decker, down the road and I was approached on, on, the, uh, on the road by this car coming at me in the middle of the road and I thought I was going to hit it. Uh, and, before, and as the car rolled to a stop, the back door flew open and Tony Morley fell out. And, and he came up to me, came up to me, he was all smiles, oh hello, 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 and I thought, I'm sorry to say this, who is this idiot? And uh, I nearly ran him over and then the two people got out of the car and I saw that it was uh, the wife was the lady who was coming to our church and she came up to me and apologised and said, look, you know, this is Tony Morley, he's come over. And, and I just thought, well, what is this bloke an idiot? And um, so anyway, you know, we, I, I let that go and he, he spoke on the Sunday at the, at the morning meeting and he was all very jolly. And, um, and we thought, you know, yeah, okay, whatever. And we were desperately in need of a pastor. He went back to Baltimore and we had to, the London church had to issue either a verbal or a written invitation to Baltimore to invite him over to be our pastor. And, and that's what we did. We were forced into it. Hmm. Now, my relationship with Tony Morley uh, was appalling. Hmm. It was appalling. His, his behaviour... Um, it, it, it was just, I'm sorry to say this, it's personal opinion, but I told him to his face in front of another guy at um, the London church, a guy called uh, Robert McKenzie, who's now at the Ellesmere Port Church, at a meeting that the three of us had. I, I asked him whether he was truly born again, because uh, he con constantly exhibited, in my opinion, what I would describe as mentally deficient behaviour. Uh, I'm the, the, the guy, well, I mean, I, I, this is 15 years on, I'm getting quite emotional now. Um, he would roll around on the floor in a suit when he was preaching on a Sunday morning. Uh, because he passed the church in a crying Ghana, he would frequently turn up 20 to 30 minutes late at every service. Mm -hmm. uh, he would roll in and say, oh, well, we're on Africa time. And I would say, no, actually, this is London. And, you know, I'm supposed to be a man of God, supposed to be a pastor. He should be 20 minutes early, not 30 minutes late. Anyway, that was normal for him. Um, he, 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 just, he came across to me as a guy who was mentally deficient. Um, we, we made many, I say we, myself, other people at the church in London, made many, uh, you can only call it complaints to Baltimore. When I was over in Budapest, um, at the one of the Eurocon conferences that they had, uh, Pastor Tom Shallow was there at the time. He was uh, he, he was a pastor in Baltimore because Carl Stevens was still alive, 
And, and I had a personal meeting with Pastor Tom Shallow, so, who I know personally and great respect for. And, and I said to him that, you know, Tony Morley is failing in the London church and you're fully aware of this. What are you going to do about it? And, and he said to me that we will, we, that they were, they meaning uh, presumably the Baltimore administration, were aware of it and were, were going to address it, but that never happened. So he's still there, Tony Morley's still there. And didn't, um, after Carl Stevens uh, was getting ill, wasn't Tom Schaller was appointed in his place, right? Well, that's not entirely correct. Um, there, there, there was a, a massive meeting, a large meeting was convened um, by, or I think this was after Carl Stevens died, if I'm correct, and I might not be, it might have been when, when he was ill, because I'm going back nearly two decades. Um, a huge meeting was convened in a, in, a, in, a, in a place called Sandy Cove, where all the pastors or the majority of the Baltimore pastors got together, and they actually elected a guy called Pastor Roger Stenger, S-T-E-N-G-E-R. Um, but there was some controversy and we were given to believe that uh, a lot of the pastors did not like, they, they weren't favourable to this guy, Roger Stenger, taking on the headship of the whole ministry. And he was, uh, I'll, I'll put it in a joking manner, he was invited to step down and suddenly Pastor Schaller was, um, he was replaced by Pastor Schaller. That's and so Pastor happened. Schaller takes the same approach as Carl Stevens of really not letting these dysfunctional and predatory pastors stay in place. Well, definitely. I mean, you know, I, I've not been there for 15 years, but uh, Pastor Tom Schaller is now unequivocally the head of the uh, Great Race World Outreach. Yeah. And he is, and um, obviously this can be proven by evidence and facts, he is allowing a guy like uh, Larry Speedy, who I understand was at the 2018 or 2019 year, uh, Budapest conference, uh, to sit next to him as a recognised pastor in a rack. Yeah, that's him there with his hand up, with his right hand up, sitting next to, that's Larry Speedy, sitting next to Pastor Thomas Schaller. Um, it, he's not only removed him or, or brought him into some kind of um, counselling, he's actually Come allowing on. him to be recognised as a, 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 a great, great recognised pastor. Exactly, yes. He's, yeah, he's... I mean, the guy, the guy on, on, on the left here, not the far left because there's someone in a bubble, but there's a guy on the left holding a, a, a book, that's Pastor Stephen Shabelli, who I also personally know. Did you have any experiences with him? No, no. I mean, you know, there's a lot of pastors at Baltimore that I would say are godly men. They teach the word of God. They, they teach the finished work of Christ. Um, I, I, I would not be able to say inconclusively that all of the Grady Grace World Outreach pastors are, are wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, I would not be able to say that. I think there's a number of pastors, especially those that disaffiliated, that have still got my respect, that are no yeah. longer part of the ministry. Well, we've got one more little detail we'd like to get to here about our friend Gislaine Doe. So yeah. this is another, this is a pastor's daughter. What can you tell us about Gislaine? Well, yeah, she, she came uh, over to America with the, the pastor and his wife. Uh, and, and their younger son. And um, yeah, she, she was initially, she was uh, a quiet young lady. I think she was late teens. I believe she was late teens. Um, yeah, she, uh, she mainly was in the background. She, she got friendly with some of the other teenage girls, girls in the London church. And um, yeah, um, she, she was mainly a background figure um, because I, I was asked by Pastor Tony Morley whilst I was there to head up the youth ministry, which I, I prayed about and I took that on. And um, Ghislaine Maxwell, as, as we're referring to her, um, her and I, well, she started confiding in me a little bit, which I, you know, I didn't particularly like, but the, uh, um, and I, I told her to go and see the lady who was asked to help me out in the youth ministry, a lady called uh, Michelle Leonard, who was quite a 
had quite a, a recognised uh, reputation, a good reputation within the ministry, both in London, massively in, in Baltimore, who, who's now remarried, now uh, Michelle Wright. And um, yeah, well, it, it became quite apparent that uh, Ghislaine Maxwell was not happy in her home in her home situation and what came to pass eventually is that I think she got to the age of 18, 19, is classified as an adult over here in the UK, the age of 18, and uh, she she eventually left the London church, went back to Baltimore on her own. Yes, yes. Solely. Okay, well that was pretty much, you know, we just wanted to to bring this information out to the public so people yeah. can be aware of what's really going on with these churches. Because Definitely. if there's if there's you know people above you aren't connected properly to God, they can actually transfer their their energy. You know their problems can get transferred to you. Uh, it's like uh, like you talked about contracts. You know it can be uh, if they're somehow in contract with the devil, they can transfer that to you. So uh, that's why uh, we just want people to have this information. And yeah, I, I mean if, if if I if, if sorry interrupting you, and it's very important if I might add. Um, it was preached from the pulpit. Carl Stevens would preach this. Um, I had a private conversation with Pastor Tom Shallow where he he said it to my face. But it was publicly taught. It was publicly uh, there was an announcement publicly made from the pulpit from Carl Stevens himself uh, that if anyone got into negativity uh, within the ministry, they would be counselled by the pastors. And, and they would be told that um, they that if they continued with the negativity, which we now know is uh, the, the reality of what has happened within that within that assembly of whatever you want to call it, a fellowship, um, actually just relating what happened. But they, they were warned that they would be taken home early, uh, which uh, isn't in the Bible and no one can find it anywhere in the Bible. But... Um, they would be warned that, and if they eventually left the ministry, left the church, um, they would be cut off. Um, people that stayed within the ministry were told that they were not allowed to have any further uh, relationship uh, with the per people, and, and the church per se would wait for the, for the person to be under God's judgment and to have an early death. So you know, that, that was a threat that was issued. Don't you say a sentence, not a sentence, not a line. Don't presume or you'll die. So there was a shunning, just like the Amish do. So they oh, would yeah. shun people and then condemn oh, them. Totally, yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah. anybody who could challenge the structure was condemned and ostracized. Yeah, totally, yeah. So I'd like to uh, show people some good places that you can. So for people who want to do more research, uh, this particular website, carlstevens.org. This website has cataloged a lot of the problems going on with this church. And, and then I have cataloged some of the information. I've pulled some from his website, but I've cataloged some information um, as well. There's been a 60 Minutes media coverage of the lawsuit. So I've cataloged and compiled some of the information as well. Not as uh, extensively as the other one. But there's information out there, and you know, just uh, do your prayer and ask God, you know, what's the best place for me to go? That's mm -hmm. ultimately the that will lead you to your answer. So, okay. Well, hey, thanks so much, Paul. Thanks for doing this interview. No, and, yes, and yeah, we'll get it um, published and and so the people uh, who need to find it can find it. And this yeah, back this, yeah. the sign behind me here. This is a guy I've been uh, protesting. He's mm. uh, he he's one of those uh, false prophets. You know, they, there's a lot of false prophets cultivated by the dark side. You know, it's to, yeah. to deceive yeah, people, yeah. and that's what this guy is. And so. I've been out protesting him and we got a newspaper. We got a few newspaper articles about him. So I have my, had my sign in, in the corner here. So I thought I'd just leave it. Yeah, um, yeah. It really, it really rattles. Really, I, I was surprised how much it rattles him to be protested. So, you know, if you speak out against something, well, you can have more effect than you realize. People don't like the truth coming out, especially when it's, um, well, you know, I, I see this, you know, God, God will purge his church in the end times. And uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of skeletons are coming out of the cupboard. Yeah, it's really amazing. You know, and I was talking about this with Paul before we started the video, how these Epstein files that have been dumped. Yeah. And apparently Oprah's in there. You know, there's people mm. in there that have had a really high uh, respectable status, but the, mm. they've 
you know, I, I, it really surprises me that she would actually be that far involved. Oh, yeah. To be complicit uh, and having anything to do with children. So, mm. yeah. Oh, well, thanks so much, Paul. And, well, and uh, I just really appreciate your speaking out. And that's the whole point. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, bye-bye.